So, and we continue, you know, we are continuing in the uh, studies of the gospel according to St. John, a, a great book, uh, greatest book in the New Testament in that it gives you that picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as God's only begotten Son, the one full of grace and truth. And ten, tonight, or today, we're coming to the uh, 13th chapter. And uh, before we get into the actual reading of this chapter, in which we'll see the Holy Spirit paint a portrait of Jesus Christ as the servant. But before we get into it, I just want to stop and pull back and get a bird's eye view of where we've been so far in the Gospel of John, having gone through 12 chapters. If you remember, originally when we were outlining the book using Dr. Wearsby's outlines, he spoke of uh, chapters 1 through 6. What, what the Holy Spirit is doing, what the Apostle is doing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's putting forth a period of consideration to consider who this Jesus is in the first six chapters. I mean, we saw him with the disciples in chapter 1. We saw him with the Jewish people at the wedding feast in chapter 2. And with the Jewish people in the temple at the uh, feast in chapter 3. We saw him with uh, the Samaritans in chapter 4. We saw him uh, moving on and speaking to the Jewish leaders in chapter 5. And then we saw him with the multitudes in chapter 6 when he fed the, uh, the 5,000. And so we see this first six chapters, they're, what the uh, apostle is doing is consider this Jesus Christ. Consider who he is. That would be the first uh, period that is given. But right after that, as soon as we got to the seventh chapter, we saw a change beginning to occur as Christ gave a teaching about Moses and that he was greater than Moses. And there became a conflict with the leaders and Jesus Christ over Moses. Then in chapter 8, there was the conflict as he taught about Abraham. And they conflicted, are you greater than Abraham? And so then after a period of consideration, we see a, a period of conflict coming on. All the way up until the last chapter, where we were in chapter 11 and 12, and in 11 he raised Lazarus from the dead, and in 12 you see that the, the people, after he spoke, did not want to hear what he said. And so it says it in chapter 12 and verse 36, These things spake Jesus, and then departed, and did hide himself from them. They had conflicted and argued with him for so long that he withdrew himself, and the public ministry ended at the end of chapter 12. Now what we're going to have here, beginning in the 13th chapter, and taking us through the end of the gospel, is we're going to have the period of climax, where the Lord is going to finish the work for which he has come here to do. His hour now will come. And it's going to begin right here today, as we're in the 13th chapter. We're going to see the climax of the preparation of the cross in chapters 13 through 17. Now this is a, a great four chapters we'll be getting into. I'm going to, did people have that? Because I'm going to take that down in a moment. Because what I want to show you is we're going to start today in chapter 13. And chapter 13 is part of a discourse that runs chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. There are five chapters together that are commonly taught as the Upper Room Discourse. John chapters 13 through 17 are commonly called the Upper Room Discourse. Now a discourse is a communication of thoughts by words. By the way, folks, that's the way we communicate. We communicate the thoughts that we have in our minds. We communicate them one to another by using words. Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus, the Word, came to speak words to us. The words that He spoke are important. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostles. That's what we're told to do by Paul, to remember the words that He spoke. Those words are found in the Bible you're holding, the King James Holy Bible. 
See, Jesus didn't come to give a message or to give ideas or thoughts. He came to give words. And so the discourse is going to be a communication of the thoughts of the heart of God through the very words you're going to read here. It will include some premises, some propositions, consequences, conclusions. All of this will be found in these five chapters. It's going to be a formal sermon that Jesus is going to give here. Chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, the upper room discourse. Now, if you read through the four Gospels, you will find there are recorded four discourses that the Lord gave. Uh, a, a, a series of teachings, a large sermon put together over many chapters. I'll give them to you very quickly if you've never been taught them. In Matthew chapters 5 through 7, you see what's the discourse known as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. In this particular discourse, the Lord is giving the rule of the kingdom of heaven. As the king in Matthew's gospel, he comes and he, he speaks to the people and he says, These will be the rules of the kingdom of heaven when I am in charge. The Sermon on the Mount, had they received the kingdom of heaven, those rules would have been operating. When he does come back at the second coming and he sets up his throne in Jerusalem, those are the rules that will be operating. The Sermon on the Mount gives the rule of the kingdom of heaven. So you can read through it sometime. The Sermon on the Mount does not give the way to get saved. Okay? It's assuming you're already in the kingdom of heaven. So those are the rules for you if you're in the kingdom. If you're not in the kingdom, then what you're supposed to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Get in the kingdom, and then you can read the Sermon on the Mount. If you attempt to follow the Sermon on the Mount without Jesus Christ, it won't profit you anything. It will profit you nothing. Because it's not by works of righteousness that you do trying to follow rules that are going to get you to heaven. It's going to be by the blood of Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrificial work for you. So the Sermon on the Mount is the rule of the kingdom of heaven given by the king. That's the one discourse. The next discourse that you'll see is found in Matthew chapter 13. This is called the Mystery Parables. The Mystery Parables Discourse. Seven parables about the kingdom of heaven are given here. It tells the reality of the kingdom of heaven in the Mystery Parables Discourse. It takes a long time to teach that. I'd love to teach it someday. When we get to Matthew's Gospel, we'll teach it. Right now we're spending time with John because I want people to get a hold of Jesus Christ. After they get a hold of him, then we can start looking at the rule of the kingdom of heaven and the reality of the kingdom of heaven. But these discourses are in there. The last discourse is also given... In Matthew's Gospel, chapters 24 and 25. Some people call this the Sermon on the Mount of Olives or uh, the Olivet, because it's given on the Mount of Olives, the Olivet Discourse. This is a prophetic teaching about the revelation of the Kingdom of Heaven. The rule of the Kingdom of Heaven, the reality of the Kingdom of Heaven, the revelation of the Kingdom of Heaven. These three are all in Matthew's Gospel. They deal with the Kingdom of Heaven because the Lord Jesus Christ is the King of the Jews going to establish His throne and His Kingdom on earth someday. The one we're in now, though, is going to be in John's Gospel, chapter 13 through 17, the Upper Room Discourse. Now, what's going to happen in this particular discourse is the Lord Jesus Christ is going to teach this Look at verse 1 in Matthew, or in John 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Notice, having loved his own. The upper room discourse is going to be given to those that are his. He just withdrew from public ministry last chapter, 12, verse 36, end of the verse. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. The public ministry is now over. Again, looking at John's Gospel, John 1 through 12. In John 1 through 12, we have a public ministry. Consider him. 
Part of the public wants to argue with him. There's conflict going on. But it's a public ministry that's given in John 1 through 12. What you're going to see in John 1 through 12 is he is going to show that he is light. He is light. It's going to give you the light on the person of Jesus Christ and why he came and who he is and what he does. When we get now to John 13 through 17, the upper room discourse, it's now going to move to private ministry, to those who are his own. And in here, it's not light anymore, it's love. Now the Lord Jesus Christ, to his own, is going to pour his love out to his own through the very words that he's going to speak to them. When we finally get to the very end... In, in John 18 through 21, it will, will no longer be public ministry or private ministry. It'll be the ministry of preparation, a preparation ministry, or actually a better word that I can think of that I came up with yesterday is propitiation. Propitiation ministry. And that's the, the offering himself as the Lamb of God to pay the sins of the world, to appease an angry Father, God, who has judgment, just and righteous judgment, and must judge sins. So, in this one, in the propitiation ministry, the topic is life. He is light, He is love, and He is life. And through His death, He brings life. Now, when we move in to these particular chapters, what's going to happen? Now, now do you see, because we're, we're going to move in now. We're, we're going to get the helicopter and start bringing it down, getting closer and closer and closer. We've looked at the big overview of the different books of the Gospels. Now we're looking at various discourses. Now we're moving into one, and I want to take it in a little bit closer until we get into every verse and every word. Pulling in a little bit closer, what's going to happen in these five chapters of the Upper Room Discourse where he's going to show love to his own in a private ministry? Well, in chapter 13, we'll see him as the servant. When we get to John chapter 14, the very next one, you'll see him as the great consoler. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. You're going to get comfort from the Lord Jesus Christ. He will console you if you're one of his own. He will take care of you. That's who you turn to in times of trouble. In chapter 15, you will see him as the true vine. I am the true vine. Ye are the branches. This is his manifestation and teaching of love in this discourse. In chapter 16, you will learn that he is the giver of the Spirit. In the Old Testament ministry, the Holy Spirit was not given to reside inside anyone. We'll learn in John chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit will be given to live inside of you through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how the gift of the Holy Spirit is given. And then finally in chapter 17 of the Upper Room Discourse, we will see the Lord Jesus Christ as the great intercessor. And you will see the magnificent prayer recorded in that chapter that truly is the Lord's Prayer. I know we call the Lord's Prayer the one that we pray, Our Father who art in heaven. That was the prayer He gave to us. It's kind of like a disciple's prayer. The Lord's Prayer is found in John 17. And when we read that prayer, we are treading on holy ground. We take off our shoes because we're going to be on holy ground that Sunday. And that's a great chapter. We probably won't finish it in one, one Sunday. So I want you to see this upper room discourse is going to be private, given to those that are His own. And the subject is going to be love. The everlasting love that he has for you and for me. And now that we're moving in, let's uh, see how this chapter divides out. We'll be lucky to get through the first five verses today. Uh, verses 1 through 5. What will be painted for us is a portrait of humility. And it will show Jesus and the Father. 
when we move on to verses, I think it's 6 through 11, we'll see a picture of holiness. And this will show Jesus and Peter. I'll just and verses I'll just put it down for your notes. We're not going to get to them obviously. And then in verses 12 through 17 we'll see happiness. And this will be Jesus and the disciples. As we move into this upper room discourse and we see him as the servant, these are the lessons that will be taught. So let's start with verses 1 through 5 and we'll comment on, on the key words in the verses. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he, he was come from God, and went to God, he riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. After that he poureth water into a basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now, He's just been rejected by the people. He's spoken and his public ministry has ended. And the disciples might have wondered, okay, that's it. He's finished. And now what he wants to do is, before this feast of the Passover, the Passover, will, he will be the Lamb of God on this cross. And he knows from the foundation of the world the suffering that he's going to go through on this cross. That particular day from the morning when it begins with the scourging and the beatings and the whipping and the carrying of the cross and the mocking and the laughing and the being nailed to the cross and hanging there and the agony, knowing all this that's going to go on, he never sets his love for his disciples aside. He loves them unto the own. Unto the end. He's loved them from the beginning. He's loved them through the ministry. And he focuses on them rather than himself. And he loves them right to the very end. His love is an everlasting love. It comes out of eternity. It works through time. And goes back into eternity. Taking us with it. We are swept along by the tides and the oceans of his love into his presence forever and ever. He loves us through every moment of time all the way until the end. A poem uh, was written, his love no end or measure knows. No change can turn its course. Eternally the same it flows from one eternal source. That's from God the Father the Son and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. It's an everlasting love. And so, yes, the public ministry was over, but the private ministry continues. And he loves his disciples, that's you and me, to the end. So, here's what he's going to do. It says, and supper being ended. And supper being ended. Now, now here's the confusion. Some people like to help the Bible. And they think, okay, we've got to fix that phrase. Because the supper's ended, uh, how can this possibly have happened? Because later on in verse 26, it says, uh, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now that's supper up there. So how could supper have ended in verse 2? What it means is the preparation for the supper was ended. They had been working all day in preparing it. Back in Matthew and Mark and Luke's Gospels, you read there. And they said, what shall we do to prepare the Passover? He says, you go find a man carrying a jug of water. And he will take you to an upper room and there prepare the supper for me. And so the supper, the preparation was ended. And they were sitting down getting ready to eat. And just before it was time to eat, Jesus wanted to give one last object lesson to his disciples. See, Jesus always wants to teach us no matter what the circumstance. Jesus is looking to help us grow in grace and knowledge. So before it's time to eat, what he does, he's going to rise, verse 4, he riseth up from the supper 
and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. He's going to give a live object lesson to them. The preparation for the supper was laid down. Now here's what happens. A contrast is going to be pointed out in verse 2. Remember, 2 is a number of division. There's going to be a division here. The contrast in verse 2 is now the preparation for the supper. It's all ready. And what's happening? The devil is now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. The contrast we have between verse 1 and verse 2. Jesus, love in verse 1. Hate in verse 2. We have the Savior in verse 1. We have Satan in verse 2. We have devotion to those that are his own in verse 1. We have betrayal to God's Son in verse 2. We have the Father mentioned in verse 1. We have the devil mentioned in verse 2. We have the Christ, Jesus, in verse 1. We have the Antichrist, Judas, in verse 2. Again, the Bible wants us to be plain and clear. There's good in the world, there's evil in the world. The world is a mix of light and darkness. The world thinks it's all shades of gray. God wants us to know, no, there's a great contrast down here in this world. Now, the devil's devices. How does the devil work? Notice what it says. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. He puts into the heart. Folks, you and I have thoughts that run through our mind and through our heart. That's where the devil works. He put thoughts in our minds and our hearts. This is how the devil works. If, if you could just get a hold of this, that not everything that comes into your mind came from God, nor from yourself. Thoughts come into your mind and heart from the devil. Have you ever observed this in your life? Have you ever tried to pray and gotten strange thoughts pop into your head and into your heart while you're praying? Dirty thoughts of sin. It never happened to you? It's happened to me. Now, where'd they come from? Well, I know the Holy Spirit didn't put them there. And I don't think I was doing it because I was going to talk to God. There is an enemy at war with our hearts, with our souls. And he doesn't relent, even if you're one of God's own. He doesn't relent. Now, if you're not one of God's own, here's a sad thing. He puts thoughts in your heart that you become captive to. Judas is not one of the disciples, the apostles. We'll find this in John chapter 17. He's one of the apostles and disciples that was chosen for a purpose, but he's not going to be the one that's chosen to be one of the 12 foundation of the Lamb that we find in Revelation chapter 19 and 20. That's going to be Paul up there. But he's chosen for a purpose to teach us a lesson that betrayal comes from within. Betrayal will come from within. Inside the church is where betrayal begins. Inside the fellowship around the table, betrayal begins. There's always going to be some tears that creep in unaware. And the devil's going to put those thoughts into hearts and minds of people that are betraying. Let me show you the two devices he has. One is found here and the other is found in Genesis 3 verse 1. There are two major devices that the devil uses. Genesis 3.1, the first time the devil ever speaks recorded in Scripture. Genesis 3.1. Two major devices. Number one, here we go. Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. See, subtlety is what he's going to use. He was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, here is device number one. Yea, hath God said. Yea, hath God said. The number one attack that he uses is to attack the word of God. To get you to question the word of God. Did God really say that? Are you sure God said that? Can you be certain that that's from God? Do you really know that that Bible you're holding in your hands is from God? Had God really said that? 
Do you really think that King James Bible is from God? Isn't it just a translation? Didn't just some men give that to you? Or maybe the original Hebrew and Greek, what really is, yea, hath God said. His device doesn't change. He will attack the Word of God. He attacked it back when the Hebrews had it. He attacked it when the Greeks had it. And he attacks it today when the Englishmen have it. And folks, you have the Word of God in the King James Bible. The devil will put thoughts in your heart and mind. Do you really have the Word of God? You know what? Yes, you do. How do you know that? The Bible answers you. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. This ministry in the upper room discourse to his own is in love, and the discourse is communicated by words, the words of our Savior Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. And the faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Yes, God has said. You can answer him right away when that thought comes in your head or in your heart. Yes, I've got the word of God. I have a Holy King James Bible. I have every word from the heart of the God that loves me, just like those disciples had it. You're going to read right here in your King James Bible what was said in that upper room. God gave it to you. That's the first attack. The second attack was found right where we were in John 13, verse 1. First, he'll attack the word of God. Secondly, he'll attack and betray the Son of God. And when you find Jesus in the temptation, in the wilderness, he comes up to him, the devil comes up to him and says, If thou be the Son of God. If thou be the Son of God. He will attack the Word of God. He will attack the Son of God. He will deny the Word of God. He will betray the Son of God. These are the two major devices that the devil uses. Subtlety, putting thoughts in your heart to question the Word of God and to betray the Son of God. He uses that on everyone. He's having great success in the world. Unfortunately, he's having quite a bit of success with Christians because we allow these thoughts of doubts and disputation to come into our mind and heart that the devil has put there. And we start to wonder. And sometimes we doubt the Word of God and often we betray the Son of God. Especially in times when we should be standing for Him and witnessing, we betray Him by keeping quiet. That's the devil at work and the portrait is painted right here. Now, going back to where we were in John's Gospel. Verse 3. Jesus knowing. Jesus knowing. The disciples might be confused. The world hasn't a clue. The devil, he's doing what he can, but Jesus knowing. All knowledge rests in God's Son. All the wisdom and treasures of knowledge are in the Son of God, who is the fullness of the Godhead manifest bodily for us. Jesus knowing. What does he know? Well, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hands, he had no doubt about it. He knew that he had the Word of God. He knew that he had the works that God wanted him to do. Jesus knew all this. He knew the inheritance he had in heaven. He knew all these things, and that he was come from God and went to God. His deity, his heavenly origin, right here in this verse. Verse 3. There's no question about it. He come from God. He's going to God. All things have give, been given to him from God. The Father loveth the Son without measure, giveth him the Spirit without measure. All things have been committed into the Son's hands, including judgment, including the words he's supposed to speak, including the works that he's done. Jesus knows all that. Now, the different, <laughs> this is beautiful. Jesus knows all these things. Jesus knows right here, I am King of kings and Lord of lords. I have all things given from my Father. I am the King of the princes of the earth. Knowing all these things, what does he do? Uh, verse 4, he riseth from the supper, and like a king he mounted a white horse, and rode triumphantly through the town, and said, I am King of kings and Lord of lords. No, he riseth from the supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself and took a basin and he started washing the disciples' feet. Wow. Humility. Humility. Jesus Christ is going to display in these first five verses humility. Humility is something that we need. 
he lays aside his garments and he girds himself for service. And he knows that he's from God and he's going to God and he knows that all things are in his hands and yet he's going to humble himself to be a servant. Turn back to Mark chapter 9. Mark is the gospel of service. Mark shows the Lord Jesus Christ as the greatest servant that ever lived. No sooner you hit that gospel, you hit the ground running and he's doing things and he's serving mankind on behalf of and for the glory of his Father. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Picking it up in verse 33. And he came to Capernaum, a little town up there in, in Galilee. And being in the house, he asked them, he said, what was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? Because there had been a disputation that disputed something. And they held their peace, verse 34. For by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest? I wonder if, if uh, Peter's going to be the greatest disciple. I wonder if I'll be the greatest disciple. I wonder if maybe Thomas or James or John. And this is what they were talking about. I mean, who's going to be the number two guy right next to Jesus? Verse 35, And he sat down, and he called the twelve, and he saith unto them, Look, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. What he wants to teach us is humility. You want to get high? Then, then get low. Bow down. Get on your knees. Meet the needs of people. Get right down to their feet and minister to their needs. You want to be the first of all? Then, then you're going to be the servant of all and the last of all. Go to the next chapter, chapter 10. Same kind of things going on again. Verse 40, to sit on my right hand and on my left hand, it's not mine to give. It shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. God the Father has determined who's going to sit where in the pecking order of heaven. So, so why don't we let God, isn't he a better judge than any of us? Why don't we just leave it to God? Verse 41, and when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John because they wanted high positions. Verse 42, Jesus called them unto him and he saith, look, you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, you know, the governor, the assemblymen, the president, uh, the kings, uh, the princes, uh, they exercise lordship over them, over the Gentiles. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you, whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whomsoever of you will be chiefest of all shall be the servant of all, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, now, no servant is greater than his Lord. And Jesus Christ, knowing that he came from God and goes to God, knowing that he has everything inherited in the world, he is now bowing down and he is washing the feet of the disciples. Here he's taught in the classroom in, of Mark 9 and 10 the, the, the lesson he wants, and now in John 13, he's going to go into the laboratory and actually demonstrate the lesson in love. Humility. Humility. Let me go back to where we were in John. John 13. Humility is, is a freedom from pride. Humility is a lowliness of mind. Remember, the thoughts in our hearts and in our mind, having a lowliness of heart, a lowliness of mind. Humility involves an act of submission. Paul said in one point when he was speaking to the church at Ephesus, he says, I have been serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Paul was a great Christian. Some people think maybe Paul was the greatest Christian that ever lived. I mean, Jesus is the greatest of all. He's the God-man. But when you take Jesus and you just look at men who were born down here on the earth, who were born of husbands and wives and fathers and mothers, many people think Paul's the greatest Christian that ever lived. And you know, he says, when I would serve the Lord, I did it with all humility of mind. I removed all pride. I took all the things that I had learned and I counted them as dung, garbage, doo-doo. Humility of mind. A great apostle. Humility is confused. A lot of people think humility means thinking negative about yourself. 
thinking bad about yourself, thinking meanly about yourself. That's not humility. Humility is simply not thinking of yourself. That's what it is. I know a lot of super saints, oh, you know, I'm this and I'm that, I'm a bad guy, I'm no, and then they're walking and they think that's some kind of form of humility. Humility is not thinking about yourself. It's emptying yourself of thoughts about yourself and thinking of others. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. See, Jesus knew all those things and he set aside his garments and his robe of righteousness and he thought of the 12 disciples. He realized the next day, I'm going to be crucified. It's going to be terrible, but they're going to be without their leader. They're going to be without their Lord. They're going to be separated for three days from me. And he was more worried about them than he was worried about himself. He was thinking of those men in the room rather than himself. That's humility. That's humility. Philippians chapter 2. And verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but, if you will, look every man also on the things of others. That's humility. You know, we get self-focused, self-interested, self-esteem. That's all the opposite of humility. It's looking on the needs around us. That's what Jesus is demonstrating for us right here in these first five verses in the upper room. He's going to start with an object lesson before he says anything. He's going to lead by action. He's going to show charity, love in action, a labor of love, loving them unto the very end. True humility grows out of your relationship with the Father. The closer you and I come to the Father, the more He can mold us into the image of His Son, where we can have humility also. Christianity today, and I get the magazine, is filled with a worldly, competitive spirit. How big is the church? How many people are we running on a Sunday? How many buses are coming? How many dollars have we made? How many numbers have we baptized? Competing with Bible memory drills. Competing with this type of thing. And that is a spirit that is not of the Lord. Who's the best? Who's the greatest? We're number one. We're the biggest church in the Northeast. That is not from the Lord. That's all esteeming yourself rather than looking on the needs of others around. That competitive spirit doesn't come from the Bible, it comes from the world. And sadly, these books are being reproduced. One of the biggest books in churchianity today is the purpose-driven church. And the purpose is to make the church bigger. That's not the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church, Jesus builds the church. And the church is built on the Word of God. And all we're to do is to take the Word of God and sow the Word of God. Let me show you Philippians chapter 2. Look at the third verse. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Today the world is teaching about self-esteem. You need a good self-esteem. No, you need an, a, a good other esteem. That's what you need. You need to empty yourself of esteem and esteem others. That's what the Bible's trying to tell us to do. You want to esteem something? Take a look at Psalm 119, verse 128. Keep your finger in Philippians. We're going to go back. but Psalm 119, verse 128. The Bible says, why don't you esteem others? Psalm 119, verse 128. A couple of things the Bible talks about esteeming. It doesn't tell you to esteem yourself. It says esteem others. And here's something very important to esteem. Psalm 119, verse 128. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. There's something you should esteem. How about the Word of God? Well, the devil's got me to doubt it. Yea, hath God said, well, why don't we just esteem this book to be right concerning all things? You have a need in your life? You want to minister to someone in, in, in their life? This book will have the precepts to help you meet that need. That's something to esteem. Let me show you the problem that's happened in Christianity today. Turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 12. I'll show you and put this on the board. How much time I got, Joe? Mm -hmm. 
beautiful. We'll make it. Here's the problem in Christianity today with self-esteem as opposed to humility. The problem, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, my, my Bible says shut up and then i got to go to the next page. <laughs> and, and I know that's not what the verse says, but sometimes that's what we need to do is just shut up. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even till, watch, the time of the end. Now, folks, we're in the time of the end. How do we know? Because many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. We live in a time today when knowledge is increasing. There's an exponential growth in the amount of knowledge coming out in in any field whether it be technology science medicine uh, botany no matter where you are there's more and more knowledge being acquired astronomy all the fields are growing we're in the time of the end when knowledge is being increased knowledge is being increased about a lot of things including bible knowledge one of the reasons is we get to build on the shoulders of the generations before us so the writings of Wesley, and now the writings of Billy Sunday, and Dwight L. Moody, and, and uh, who's the one that did, uh, Clarence Larkin, and all these great people from the past were building on their shoulders, and Bible knowledge is increasing. But let me show you the problem with that. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. The problem, believe it or not, is knowledge. Knowledge is in power. Knowledge can be a problem if it's not rooted in God. Here's what happens. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, verse 1. Now, as touching uh, things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. Knowledge puffeth up. Ah, I'm a pretty smart guy. I got some self-esteem about my knowledge. It puffs me up. It gives me pride rather than humility. Knowledge puffeth up up. That's the problem. Knowledge puffeth up. Now God can fix this problem with a little principle that he has. Go to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. Jesus knew all things. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Jesus knew all things, but he didn't allow that knowledge to corrupt him. You're allowed to have knowledge. God wants us to have knowledge, but he doesn't want us, the knowledge to puff us up. So here's what he wants. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. The principle is to grow in grace first. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's second. You see, what God's principle is, grow in grace. And one of the problems is if we get that out of order and we try and grow in Bible knowledge before we grow in grace, we can get puffed up, we can esteem ourselves too highly, and we won't have the humility to do the very things that the Lord would have us to do. We need to grow in grace. Let, let me tell you something. When, when a child grows physically and his long bones, there are things called growth plates at the end of the bone. And the bone adds and adds and adds and adds and adds. And then at a certain time, the growth plate closes and the bone can't lengthen anymore. And that's it. He's reached his maximum height. I've reached my maximum height of 5'9 or whatever it is I am. I've forgotten. I'm not growing anymore. Here's a beautiful thing about this verse right here. Peter finishing his second epistle, writing to people who've read many things about the Lord and our, and our older Christians is saying, Just continue to grow in grace. No matter how far you are in the Christian life and Christian walk, you can continue to grow in grace. There's no spiritual growth plates to close in your spiritual bones. You can continue to grow. You can be a 300-foot Christian in grace. To grow in grace. That's the principle God wants. To grow in grace. Now, that's the Peter principle right here. Okay, there's the Peter principle, grow in grace. Now, now, now the policy that God establishes to do it is found in, in two books. Go before it, Peter, 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. The policy that God uses for that principle is found in 1 Peter 5, and it'll be found twice the same way. If you got 1 Peter 5, you can go to the book before it in James chapter 4. 
And you'll look at these two verses and they're the same. A verily, verily. This is the, the policy God's going to use to help you grow in grace. James 4, look at verse 6. But he, God, giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. You see that, James 4, 6? God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Remember humility? Remember humility? You want to grow in grace? You need humility to grow in grace. You don't need humility to grow in knowledge. You can have a big puffed up mind and grow in knowledge. But you want to grow in grace, you need humility. God gives grace and he gives it to the humble. Same thing Peter says, 1 Peter 5, 5. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility. Here it is. For God resisteth the proud, giveth grace to the humble. God giveth grace to the humble. The policy is this. Humility is the only soil in which the seeds of grace can take root. Andrew Murray said that. The seeds of grace that God wants to plant in your heart can only get into the root, into the soil of humility. Any other soil, the seed won't grow. Self-esteem, grace doesn't grow. Puffed up mind, grace doesn't grow. Trying to be the best in the church, grace doesn't grow. Humility, ah, the seeds of grace, they take root and they bring forth fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. Humility is the only soil into which the seeds of grace can take root. Humility. That's why it says, God resisteth the proud. He resisteth the proud. God does not like pride. Andrew Murray said that humility is the only soil into which the seed of grace takes root. Lack of humility, if you do not have a humble mind, if you do not have a lowliness of mind, that will explain the defects and the failures and the faults in your Christian life. I got a friend of mine, a brilliant guy, knows a lot of Bible knowledge. But, but I'll tell you, that humility hasn't quite gotten a hold of him and the grace doesn't take root. It's, it's got to be, the lack of humility causes problems. Go to Proverbs. I'm going to show you a few verses in Proverbs. Proverbs. Start in verse 13, or chapter 13. Chapter 13, Proverbs 13. The opposite of humility is pride, that self-esteem thing that's being taught in the world, thinking highly of yourself. Jesus, knowing all things, laid aside those garments, and in humility, he served those around him, no matter what was going on in his life, even the cross the next day. 13, verse 10, only by pride cometh contention. When I hear of two Christians fighting and they're contending about something, you know what I know is going on? There's not enough humility in each one of them. There's pride. There's pride. When I hear about a Christian husband and wife fighting over, I don't care what the issue is, I know what the problem is. Pride. Somebody isn't going to give up their rights. Somebody isn't going to lay aside their garment and be humble in the situation. That, that's the book said. Only by pride cometh contention. You lay aside that pride and you get humble and you watch grace grow and the fruit of the Spirit come forth and that problem will vanish away. That problem will vanish away. Other verses you can study at home, Proverbs 8, 13, Proverbs 11, 2, Proverbs 16, 18. You can check them out on your own time. Check them out. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly, with the lowly is wisdom. Not knowledge, folks. Wisdom. Knowledge is bits of information. Wisdom is applying the information you know. The saddest things I see with a lot of Christians is they know a lot of Bible and they don't live it. They don't live it. And God wants, in order to live it, you need humility. You need humility so God's grace can take root in the soil. So, so the problem, too much knowledge. The principle, we need to grow in grace. The policy by how God does it is He gives grace to the humble. Okay, so what's the procedure I'll follow to get this to work out in my life? God's going to give you a procedure to follow. Go back to where you were in James. I'll show you the procedure. Say, can this ever work for me? Yes, it can. Of course it can. God wants you to have the victory. He's going to show you how to get it. 
James chapter 4. <laughs> Book is rough. I love it. Verse 4. <laughs> ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You've got to get that love of the world out of your heart. Now here's how you do it. Verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. The first act of submission you and I need as a Christian is to submit to God. Look at the first thing we did to get our relationship with Jesus Christ is repentance toward God. We turned to God in the first place. We turned to God and said, God, help me, save me. And God turned us to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, said, place your faith there. Now as a Christian, what we need to do is to go back and submit to God. To get under God. Jesus knew all things. He knew His Father had given Him all things. By the way, do you know you have all the riches of inheritance in Christ Jesus? All those riches have been committed to you and me. So what do we do? We don't run around and boast about it. We lay aside that inheritance till the time it comes in the future. And we submit to God. Submit to God. The first thing, submit to God. Esteem the precepts of God above all things. Want to hear the Bible. You want to read the Bible. You want to pray to God. Submitting to God. This is the procedure. Submit to God. It's about a relationship with God. I have a feeling there's some Christians that go to bed without praying at all. They get up in the morning without praying at all. They might go through an entire day without reading the Bible or listening to a Bible tape at all. Well, then how can you be submitted to God if you're not talking to Him or hearing from Him? The first thing that's needed is submitting to God. <clears throat> And then the next thing, notice, and look at verse 8. Draw nigh to God. Draw nigh to God. Submit and draw nigh. Say, God, I want to be closer to you. I'm trying to get closer to you. Boy, when you draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. He'll come rushing out of heaven to you. He's faithful. He is faithful. Submit to God. Draw nigh to God. And then notice the next book, 1 Peter chapter 5, where we also saw another verse about resisting God resisting the proud and giving grace to the humble. Here's the one other thing you do. You submit to God. You draw nigh to God. And then you do this, 1 Peter 5. <clears throat> Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Here it is. Yea, let me sum it up. All of you, be subject one to another. Be subject to one another. There are needs around you. I was working the other day at the hospital. And, and I, I had a desire to go somewhere, to go to a movie and to see the passion. And I was only supposed to do one operation in the morning. And I found out they needed to do three more plus another procedure. As soon as I emptied myself of my desires and just laid myself out there humbly to serve others, there was no problem anymore. It's, it's not thinking meanly of yourself. It's not thinking of yourself. It's being subject to one another. There were other people around that had needs that day. So I put aside my desires and it became very easy. Jesus Christ demonstrates this in an object lesson for us right here. He knows all these things. We have so much Bible knowledge. Don't let it puff us up. Lay aside all those garments. Be subject one to another. Help one another. There are needs. There are people that have needs. Now, that's all we can do today. We're going to go on. There's much more to be said about these verses, and we'll go on next week. Any questions on what we looked at today on the importance of humility? Remember, humility is the soil in which God can plant the seeds of grace, and only the Father can plant the seeds. He giveth grace to the humble. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the teaching, the object lesson of Jesus in humility, getting down to wash our feet. If, if the Savior would lower himself to serve us, how can we not lower ourselves to help others?
we who are just sinners saved by grace. Lord, help us this week to serve one another. Help us to submit to you, to draw nigh to you, and to be subject to those around us who have needs and to bring forth the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.